Good morning, family. Today we conclude our series called Why. Today is part four, the final part called Why God Wants Us to See the Bigger Picture. Doesn't take long to realize California is a painful place to live. We got natural disasters, right? Like, you know, every year, earthquakes and landslides and mudslides. We have our wildfires are so severe, they call them firestorms and developed a new term, gigafires. Millions of acres burning in the state in the last several years. We have mega droughts and, and heat waves. And we have, uh, and those things are only done uh, away with by super storms like we've seen this winter, uh, which cause flooding. And uh, much of California has some of the worst air quality in the entire United States. And then there's the moral calamities of living in California. Statewide violent crime is up year after year. Merced County takes the number one spot of most homicides and murder rate in the state of California, Merced. Uh, Tulare and Kern County to follow right after that. Property crime has increased, especially shoplifting. Have you been reading the news? <laughs> Smash and grabs. Home invasions are up. And all the while, the arrest rate has plummeted. And part of the reason why is because we don't have a lot of room left in our prisons. We've got 100,000 people in the state who are incarcerated. But it's also due to lenient laws that have replaced more restrictor laws, of punitive laws. We have one of the highest rates of human trafficking in the United States, partly because we are on the Pacific Ocean. And a lot of it happens from there and to there. We have the second highest number of registered sex offenders, pedophiles, in the United States. No other state in the, in the Union can claim more children in poverty than California. We have people who are uh, children who are raised in homeless situations, drug addicted situations, mental health situations. And all of us know about the cost of living here. We all know how very expensive it is to live in this state. Real estate prices, uh, regulation, taxation, uh, create gigantic financial hardship. In 2018, U.S. News and World Report did a study on the quality of life in each state of the Union, and California placed 50th out of 50 the lowest quality overall of life. Pain is a very real problem. Suffering can actually cause a lot of people to lose their faith in God. Ironically, though, God's the one who <laughs> has created us to feel pain. Hmm. Do you know that your body doesn't have any pain cells? No, you've got receptors all throughout your body, and those are connected to a neural network that leads to your brain. There is no pain cell. So I, I want to do a little practice with you, okay? Just take your hand and put it right here. Now blow. The largest organ in your body is your skin, and all those receptors on your on your skin connected to your hairs and just even your skin itself could feel that sense that and so if you back up into a muffler on a lawnmower your skin's going to tell you about that now isn't it i've done that have you ever done that boy that'll wake you right up won't it when i was in india i visited some leper colonies and and i preached there and um, the people are very, very, very self-conscious, as you can imagine. And, and many of them were missing feet and, and uh, hands um, and other parts. Some, some were missing noses, actually. But they, they kept their faces covered 
the entire time. Uh, leprosy destroys that, those neuro receptors. So they don't know if they backed up against a hot stove with their appendage. They don't know it. They're, they're, the only way they would know is they can smell their skin burning. In fact, I was really upset, and, and uh, so I'm going to make you upset, okay? I'm going to tell you what I found out, that some of the people in these leper colonies would wake up and their toes and digits would be missing, gnawed off in their sleep by rats. Now, the reason why I'm so gross is because I want you to realize pain is a good thing, too. It's good to know that a rat's gnawing on your finger, don't you think? It's good that we have pain. Pain has a purpose. God created pain on purpose so that we could have sensitivity, that we could function, that, that, that we could uh, you know, protect ourselves and be able to, to navigate and do things that are important in our life. But our society has decided that anything that hurts is evil. They've decided that pain is evil. It is the dreaded thing of all dreaded things in common America is to feel discomfort. Think of the billions of dollars that Big Pharma makes on causing you not to feel pain. Think of all the prescriptions in America that are opioid-based. Think about all the fentanyl that's coming across the border in, in droves or heroin. All those opioids do one really good thing. They numb pain. And, and up until we idolized comfort, hurting was an accepted part of life. The natural part of our life is that you're going to do things and things are going to happen and it's going to hurt. There used to be an acceptance of that. Now, if you, the moment you sense the headaches coming on, you're headed to the medicine cabinet. How do I know that? Because that's where I'm headed. And if you looked at my medicine cabinet and you open it up, there's... There's a Excedrin, extra strength on the left. In the middle, there's just good old aspirin. How many people still do just good old-fashioned aspirin? Well, you got a good stomach for it, don't you? It works. But then on the other side of it, I have Tylenol, because that covers a different kind of pain. So <laughs> when my sons come and visit, I go, gee whiz, Pop. I mean, you got a whole shelf devoted to pain. I go, yeah, I don't like it. I said, you get my age, you're going to start figuring out it's, there's ways to prevent a lot of misery. But my point is, is that people outside of the kingdom of God are saying that pain is evil. But just because something hurts doesn't mean it's bad. Can I get an amen? In fact, there are reasons why things hurt. There is a reason why we live in a world where we suffer. There are reasons why God allows suffering in this life. And as fewer and fewer people in our land read the Word of God, and as fewer and fewer Christians who attend church are reading the Word of God, then because their personal knowledge of God is limited, then 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 they don't understand why things are happening the way they are. And that's the reason for this series, is to equip you to help other people to understand the reasons why this life hurts. And it's challenging, and it's, it's a big pain to live. And there's a reason for that. And here's a few things to answer the question of why God allows pain and suffering, a, a, a bigger picture. Number one, he allows bad things to happen to test our faith. The question is, is your faith indestructible or is it what I would call fickle faith? Is it based on circumstance, meaning that when everything's going well, you have a lot of it, and when things aren't going well, you don't have hardly any of it? Is it based on your comfort? Is it based on your material wealth? Do you worship God when everything's going well, and then when it stops going well, you stop worshiping God and praying to God or attending assembly because things are something bad happened? 
That's fickle faith. Is your faith situational or relational? When speaking of Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 32, 31 says, God left him to himself in order to test him and know all that was in his heart. God allowed Hezekiah to go through something so that it would reveal to him what was going on in his heart. So these tests that we go through are for our benefit. And and I would hope that all of us want a permanent faith, a resilient faith. Hardship forges our faith, doesn't it? It hones the edge But you see, when you take a knife blade and you forge it, you're pounding pressure on it to make it more resilient. So it doesn't break under pressure. And when you're you're honing the edge of a a knife blade, you're scraping off and and pressurizing that, that leading edge so that it becomes sharper. A sharper knife is better than a dull one. And they both require resistance. And so the reason why God designed weakness and pain is is to release us from this world, which is not God's world. The world I'm talking about is not the kingdom of God. I'm talking about the world under the control of the evil one, the system that is against Christ and his followers. Would the Israelites ever have left Egypt if they weren't beaten and forced into slavery? No, that slavery caused him to cry out for God, and when he sent a deliverer, they followed. The reason God designed weakness and pain in old age is to get us to let go of this life, to yearn for an eternal one. And I just told you why so many churches are filled with elderly people, because they're getting closer to that heaven place, right? It's... They're more attuned to the spiritual part of life than the material part. There's a reason for that. Why why do churches have so many old people in them? The ones that are uh, struggling to get out the door, the ones that are having to use a cane, the ones that are having to use a walker, the ones that are having to have uh, special glasses and hearing aids and all that. Why are so many people in the church so elderly? Because y'all are getting close to it, amen? I mean, you're, you're not way back, way back. You're like, there's the doorknob. <laughs> I'm coming up on it. But the other thing is that you've lived a full life and you've realized that comfort and pain and money and bank accounts and health, that doesn't mean all that. There's something greater than all that. You know that. As one brother told me years and years ago, getting old ain't for sissies. It ain't. <laughs> Here are some of the problems from getting old. One is there's more of you to love, especially the middle part. Okay? Imagine if you were getting younger instead of older, everyone else would hate your guts. Going to bed is simpler when you're older. All you have to do is fall asleep in your chair. Your supply of brain cells is finally down to a manageable size. If you don't like a movie, just go to sleep. Dinner out costs less because if you, you know, like most people, you start eating between four and six, right? Your investment in health insurance is beginning to pay off. Your secrets are safe because all the people you told secrets to can't remember them anymore. And it's easier to pick your teeth now. All you got to do is take them out. There's an image. Thanks again, Ray. Thanks again, buddy. Another reason why God allows suffering is to teach us obedience and humility. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not discipline? Well, if you've been to a mall, you see a lot of that. (laughs) Uh, 
If you are left without discipline in which you have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of Spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. There's the deal. That God loves us enough to do whatever it takes to make us holy. And that requires, at time, to teach us the value of obedience. The value of humility. Will God bless bad behavior? Answer? No. Does he still love us even though we're hurting? Yes. How much? Enough to let the hurting teach you, to discipline you. Bad experiences are pretty powerful reminders. C.S. Lewis has said they are the megaphones of life that get our attention. Up uh, megaphones that God uses, by the way. And and these and the pain and the hurt and 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 the, and the things that we suffer also teach us and remind us of how we've caused other people to suffer. I know we don't think about this much, but it's true. Because of our own foolishness and stubbornness and disobedience and sinfulness, we have hurt other people. How many people come to mind right now that you've hurt? Who are you hurting right now because of the kind of person you've turned out to be? Due to our selfishness, People are hurt. They're injured. They lose sleep. Due to our sinfulness, the church loses sheep. God allows suffering to get us to stop being hurtful to others, to be the sources of other people's pain. And also to teach us humility. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and he begged God to remove it, and God said, Basically, you don't need that removed. My grace is sufficient for you. Meaning, you don't need to feel comfortable. You need to be saved. And you need my grace in you. And he got that. Oh, by the way, why did he get the thorn in the flesh? To prevent me from being conceited and puffed up in my own mind. You think if he wasn't humble and it never had happened? That's right. What lesson does the humble person need to learn from God? Ah, exactly. Number four, God allows trials to develop wisdom and strength for future usefulness. James chapter 1 has one of the most unusual things to say about this. It's a head scratcher for sure. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What? Be happy or miserable. What? I mean, that makes zero sense. Unless, of course, you're spirit-filled and spirit-in-tuned. And what's he say? It says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and steadfastness will have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. So, there will always be a crisis, and there will always be a hurt to be absorbed, and there will always be an illness. There will always be a loss. And they're going to receive pressure from your friends, from your peers, your co-workers, your neighbors, your own family members. There's going to be job stress until you retire. There's going to be injustice as long as you live within this legal system. And so what is James saying? God is speaking through the brother of Jesus and saying, don't give in to despair. Be glad you're being strengthened. Now, if I'm a positive mental attitude guy or a motivational speaker, don't be a whiner, be a winner. And that's exactly the sentiment here. 
Don't feel sorry for yourself. Fight. Get smarter. Get stronger. And this is the way that God does this sometimes. He allows trials to develop our strength. Christianity isn't a bunch of shallow optimism ignoring painful aspects of life. It's, it's a reality check. It's, it's looking at reality soberly, persevering, knowing that God empowers our recovery. You know, God allowed the early church to suffer terribly. You don't have to read a lot of church history to know the first two centuries were horrific. And, and haven't you ever wondered, why did God allow his brand new baby church to be attacked so severely? The worst persecution in the history of the world against the church happened in the first two centuries. But let's flip the tapestry around and what kind of church did that become? A church that converted the very empire that tried to kill it. There were 120 people in a room when Jesus died and was buried and resurrected and he, and he went back to heaven. 120 people in that church. And it grew to where the entire Roman Empire became Christian. What kind of church did it become? What kind of church did it come underneath that pressure? Right now, in the world, the, the places where the gospel is going and growing are places where people are being persecuted. I got, a, I got an email from Louis Swakiam, our missionary in India. He told me that there was a gospel meeting this weekend and they baptized 15 people. The reason why we're trying to build them a church building is because nobody there wants to rent a church a church building. And you see, it's not, it's not just coincidence that, 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 that places that are underneath a huge, huge persecution and pressure develop the strongest Christians. The Ukraine has been a very strong spot for the church in Eastern Europe. I don't think it's just coincidence <laughs> that Satan decided to try and kill that through war. Same could be said for Asia. And the people in India and Asia and the Ukraine, they don't go to worship to get entertained. And they don't go to worship to hear how God will make them wealthy. And they don't go to worship to learn the latest craze and fad of Christianity. They attend worship to do what? Worship. They go there to sing. How do they sing? With all their soul. And the reason why? Because they're not there playing around. They're there to live life for Christ. And life is hard. They go there to worship their Redeemer. They go there because they need more hope and they need more strength. And the reason why they come together is to praise God despite all the persecution and rejection and hardship of their life and to encourage one another. And those are the people that are teaching the gospel to others. Number five, God needs to remind us that we're not in heaven yet. Romans 5 says, not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint us. The result of a worldview without God is that basically this is all there is. If this is all there is and after this we just cease to exist, if this life is all there is, then we demand that this life be better, don't we? We demand that this life be paradise. We demand that we, that, that we take care of this place in a better way. Because after this, there's nothing. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18. God never promised anywhere in all of this gigantic, beautiful book once that we are in paradise here. In fact, he promised if you, if you try to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. 
if they hated me, they're going to hate you. That's what Jesus said. Don't be surprised if people in your own family resist you, turn you in. Which they did, by the way, the early church. Absolutely all of that happened. You see, we don't talk about heaven much. We don't sing about heaven much. We're doing a little better here in this congregation the last several years. But you see, people aren't even thinking about heaven. So what that means is this has to be more better. And this isn't ever going to be paradise. And finally, the ultimate answer to the why question is the cross. God's son was innocent, and yet he had, I believe, the hardest life of anyone. Why? Because he did wrong? No. The greatest of all answers to the reason or the question of our time is why does God allow evil and pain and suffering? The best answer for that is to point people to the crucifixion of Jesus because he didn't avoid pain and suffering. He endured it. And that is the point. That's Second Peter. That's First Peter. We can't get away from suffering. We must endure it just as Jesus did. Dorothy Sayers said years and years ago, this, this is such a good quote, I have to read it verbatim, okay? This is just good, listen. For whatever reason, God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death. He had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he is playing with his creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he himself has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and the lack of money, to the worst horrors and pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and even death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and he died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. Wow. At the heart of our story is Jesus. The, the, the story of Jesus crucified for our sins. We see evil do its best the day that he died. And we see him who met its match, victorious. God took on evil, the most brutal thing that can happen to a person is a crucifixion, and he transformed it into a thing of redemption. Some of you wear crosses on your jewelry or engraved onto your Bibles or have it in a poster somewhere. When they crucified Christ, that was like a hangsman's noose or an electric chair or a gas chamber. There was no glory in that at all. It's the way you executed criminals. But the reason why the cross is so important to us is because God took that horrific means of execution and he turned it into a symbol of redemption. Praise God Almighty. And isn't it just like a carpenter, family? Isn't it just like a carpenter to take a cross and build out of it a throne. Because now he sits in heaven on the right hand of God, ruling as Lord of lords and King of kings, because he endured. He can make us endure. Amen. This world's filled with it. And as you get older, you're going to have more pain and more suffering and more doctors and more medications and more, 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 more. And all that means is this. This world is not our home. All that means is this, we are aliens and sojourners. This is not our place. It's our campground. It's not our home. Jesus is up there getting ready for our good home. Amen. The paradise, the ultimate paradise, the one that's better than any paradise before. That's what's in front of us. I hope you get the bigger picture. I hope you know that heaven isn't a fairy tale. I hope you know that it's real. I hope you know that after this life ends, we're going to be in a perfect place with perfect people, and you're going to be one of them. Whew, it is about time. 
I hope you understand that you're going to see your favorite people that you've missed so very long. And you're going to walk in the woods after a tough illness or a loss. And you're going to, you're going to after walking through all this pain and trouble in this life, you're going to see that blazing panoramic beauty. And you're going to hear voices in tart, uh, tart, tight harmony. There's going to be a lot of, a, a lot of singing in heaven. And behind it all, all the temptations and all the injustice and all the slander and all the accusations and all the persecutions stands an enemy seeking to destroy your faith in God, your trust in Christ, your trust in his word. And behind, behind Satan and his demonic host stands our Lord God, our almighty Adonai, who is in control. God is still in control. And you can see beyond all the hurt and the fear and the misery to see the goodness of God. And I hope you'll see the end. That there is an end to this. And that every right will be, every wrong will be righted. The message of the book of Revelation is so compelling. Maybe that's why people aren't reading it because Satan doesn't want you to. But the book is very compelling, and what it says is this. This earth might take your body and kill your body, but it can't kill you because you last forever because you belong to me. And God will destroy every evil, amen? amen. And in the meantime, we ask him to deliver us. So I want you to stand up, please. We're going to recite what's called the Lord's Prayer together. We're going to do it King James style, okay? All right. Our Father, who art in heaven, as we forgive those What happened to you? What happened? Stop, stop. You guys faded off on the very line I wanted you to say. Let's say it together. You know the prayer. Speak up. We're praying to God. Don't mumble. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Stop. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And the church said, if you have something on your heart, let us know. Let's remain standing and sing.